Well, I thought that um, I should talk about the power of blessing, just having another look at it, because I've I've heard I've heard things that I thought uh, could be done better. But I, let's put it that way. So I just want to start by saying um, what a change this blessing message has brought in my own life and the life of others. The guy who uh, brought about the Pensacola River, um, revival, John Kilpatrick, he said, uh, next to being born again and baptised in the Holy Spirit, getting married and having children, discovering the power of blessing is the greatest thing that's happened in my Christian walk. And I would have to say that that is true of me, without a doubt. I get a, um, an almost constant um, daily stream of testimony from, from all over, particularly from Africa, but not only Africa. A daily stream of testimony and pastors excited. I've got pastor at the moment in um, Swaziland talking and been in the slums of Soweto, um, other ones in Sudan and different places like that. Muslims coming to the Lord and even 10-year-old Thomas O'Neill from Toowoomba in Queensland. Just amazing, just amazing things. And so many salvations, so many reconciliations between enemies, between parents and adolescents, marriages, healings of bodies and hearts. You know, this year, I've, so far, I've printed 375,000 books and there are translations being done at the moment in uh, in uh, Myanmar um, for Bangladesh and Bengali. There's Vietnamese, Chinese ones in, in, in the pipeline. All this kind of stuff is going on. I just wanted to say that just to show what a big impact it is having. But I should just make a special mention of the Father's blessing because I think... Um, we live, in, we live largely in an unfathered world. You know, Derek Prince said that, I would say to everyone, especially to young people, and I, this is not a word-perfect quote, but this is what he was saying. He said, do whatever you have to. Crawl over broken glass if you have to, to get a father's blessing or a grandfather's blessing. That's how important he sees it is in someone's life. And I was reading the other day about someone that I admire called uh, Mark Mark to Jesus. He writes a lot of books on the healing of the heart, the healing of the soul. And he said this, the majority of people have no memory of their earthly father saying the words, I love you. Yet without knowing this was a needed experience, people will live with little healing or restoration. And the father's blessing I have done it so many times and seen so many tears that it's just incredible. You know, just the other day, I I blessed a, um, a Chinese lady and she said to me, what is love? She said, I've never experienced love. And, you know, she had been one of the Chinese girls born in the days when you were only allowed one child. <clears throat> and they would have experienced the rejection because the parents wanted a son. So, you know, I just see blessing as a um, as a wonderful way of just loving on people. You know, Jesus said we are to love God and love people. That's the ultimate purpose of it, as I see it. Just consider what that... Um, what that uh, the worship leader said just a little while ago. He said, King Jesus, we bless you with our lips. In Psalm 34, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So we are to love God. We bless God. But we also bless people. So here we are. Finally, this is in First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, 
being courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So you see, we are called to bless. It is so clear. It is so clear. I'm not making this up. We are called to bless and we will inherit a blessing. So not so long ago, I thought that blessing was um, a fluffy little word. Someone says, uh, I bless you, but they don't really mean it. It's already just a greeting. Uh, or, or, or when somebody when we when somebody leaves us, we say God, or we say God bless you, or bless you. And uh, and when we sneeze, someone will say bless you. And by comparison, I'd always seen cursing as a very bad and dangerous thing. Things that witch doctors did, and um, there were bad consequences. But when I was um, in New Caledonia, I, I learned that the French word for blessing is uh, malediction. For cursing, rather, is malediction, and for blessing is benediction. And I've since discovered that that idea of bad speaking and good speaking is in all the Latin languages, like French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese. It's even in English. I didn't realize it the other day, but the word malediction is actually in the English dictionary, and it means cursing. So when you look at malediction and benediction, you see bad speaking and good speaking. So cursing is to speak bad and blessing is to speak good. Okay, that's just by looking at those words. But when you go to the Bible, the Bible says that in the power of the, the power of the, there is death and life in the power of the tongue. So this just confirms it, that cursing is speaking words of death and blessing is speaking words of life. And of course, I don't necessarily literally mean death. I mean words of criticism, destructive words, words that tear people down. And blessing is speaking words of life, words of encouragement and inspiration and so on. And the thing is that that proverb is true in the natural and it's true in the supernatural. So in the natural, a father might tell his son that he's, he's a loser. He won't succeed at anything. He's a useless fellow. Or he might say, you're a great leader, or you're, you're good at this, or you're good at that. And, and he's speaking life to, over his son or his daughter. So that's in the natural, and it is true in the natural. I've seen it in the natural. People have come up for prayer, and, there's a, and, um, and their father has spoken like that over them. And we've had to break it off them. And the father was, was not a Christian. But the thing is, it's true in the supernatural. So when the witch doctor curses you, he's speaking and releasing death in the name of Satan. But we as spiritual Christians, we can speak and release life in the name of Jesus. So that's the comparison. The witch doctor speaks for Satan on behalf of Satan as an ambassador of Satan. And we speak for God. We speak on behalf of God as an ambassador. I just want to say that again, that as spirit-filled Christians, we're speaking on behalf of God, words of life, as an ambassador. And I'd like to, to define the blessing as speaking God's intentions and favor over someone or some situation in the name of Jesus. Now, I could say that in the Old Testament, the word for blessing is Barak, and in the New Testament is the word uh, eulogia. But at the end of the day, if you put these meanings together, you get, I think the simplest thing is to say, blessing is speaking God's intentions and favor over someone or some situation in Jesus' name. Or if you like, it's simply speaking life with a capital L in, the, in Jesus' name. And there are slightly different kinds of ways of doing it. It's giving someone an encounter with Jesus' love. I mean, for example, the other day, or in fact, I just realized that about four times in the last couple of weeks, I've blessed a waitress who's a busy person, and I've asked her if I could speak a blessing over her, and I say, I bless you in the name of Jesus. May God's love surround you and fill you. 
And may you know in the deepest part of your being what a treasure you are, how beautiful you are, how much he loves you. And sometimes this water, water comes out of their eyes, but I believe in every case that person has had an encounter with God's love. Or on other occasions, there's a, a situation of dispute. Maybe it's over a will or something else. And we can release or enable God to move in that situation from where that situation is now to where he wants it to be. Not necessarily where the person wants it to be, but where God wants it to be. And sometimes we'll recognize that someone needs wisdom or peace or something or other. So we'll speak and release and we will impart, impart something from the kingdom of God. And I think in all cases, the, the power of blessing is amplified when we invoke God's own words from, from Scripture. I think, uh, yeah. And the other thing that I want to say is that we bless from his love. You know, when, I, when I'm teaching people how to bless, like in a workshop, I'll say to them, before you bless somebody, I want you to feel God's love for that person. And sometimes I've felt that so intensively, I've actually wept myself. You know, it's such a habit with me, I feel it almost straight away. But for other people, it might take a wee bit longer. But we need to feel his love for that person because love is the carrier wave of his power. Paul said, pursue love, make love your aim, and it's true. So we're blessed to love somebody, we, but we do it from his love. We do it from his love in us. In other words, our posture needs to be one of love. And it's actually the same thing's true for everything, really. Like when we evangelize, we need to do it from love as distinct from duty. We, we love it. We're going to evangelize somebody because we love them. We heal and we deliver from love. And the hardest one, perhaps, we bless those who've hurt us or cursed us from his love. And we bless our, our spouses, our children, our community from love. You know, recently I, I, I blessed a teenage uh, girl when I was down in Huntley. And in the course of that, I said to her, and she was a bit scared to begin with, but in, the, but in the course of it, I said, Jesus loves you and I love you. And she was so touched, she turned around and said, I love you, I love you. That's what happens. There's something... There's something that happens. And unfortunately, I have found that uh, most men have a great deal of difficulty when they do or try and do a father's blessing. They, they can't say the words, I love you. And we need to change that. So the next thing I wanted to address was who actually does the blessing? Well, in Proverbs 11, 11, which is one of my favorites now, it says that by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. So I ask you the question, who speaks and releases the blessing? It's the upright, and I like to think of that as us, the church. By our blessing, a city is exalted. And I have heard so many people tear down our government, to tear down our Prime Minister, to tear down just about everything. But by the blessing, and even Christians I'm talking about, but there it is. By the, so the upright, the, we are supposed to speak and release the blessing. And in that scripture I read out from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you we're called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So it's it's us. We are called to, to speak and release the blessing. And many of you have heard this before, but when I was at Colmar Brunton quite a few years ago now, I used to go in there 
and I used, and I'd go in there early to bless the business. And I used to say, "God bless, Comma Brunton," and a whole lot of other good things. God bless Comma Brunton, but nothing ever seemed to change. And so I changed. I don't remember why I did it, and I was a bit scared to do it. But I said, Colmo Brunton, I bless you. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And immediately the anointing fell on me. And I realized that it was like God was saying, yes, son, you've got it. That's what I want you to do. So I moved from asking God to bless the company to me blessing the company in the name of God. Now, I'm not the only person who says this. There's a book called The Grace Outpouring, Becoming a People of Blessing. It's a famous book, more famous than my book, based around a, a wonderful retreat. I think it was in Wales. And I'm just quoting from that book now. Notice the pronoun I. It is I who is pronouncing the blessing in the name of Jesus over the person directly. I have not prayed to God for a blessing, but has spoken a blessing using the authority Jesus gives us to pronounce blessing on the people so that he may come and bless them. This is what Jesus commissioned us to do when he drew us into the kingdom of priests. So that's a quote from that book. And I, I, I read some time ago a book called The Overflow of the Spirit which was written by several prominent authors. And they record a conversation that purports to be from Jesus. But I think this is absolutely true. So this is this would be Jesus speaking. There are so many things you are asking me to do that I instructed you to do. You are to deal with the devil and you deal with sickness. You are to deal with it. It's time to walk in your authority. And I have felt that for a long time. I remember many years ago, I felt the Lord say to me, one, you don't know who you are. And on another occasion, if you only knew the authority you have in Christ Jesus, you would change the world. And despite all of this, so many of us are still asking God to speak to the mountain when he's told us to do it. So we have this glorious partnership where we speak blessing over others, but the Holy Spirit performs it. We speak blessing over others, and often the Holy Spirit will inspire and empower the blessing. We speak blessing, he performs it. In the same way we speak healing and or lay hands, and the Holy Spirit does the healing. We release the healing, but the Holy Spirit does it. We command deliverance with our mouths. The Holy Spirit delivers the person. We speak to mountains. He moves them. And all of this in the name of Jesus, which is the basis of our authority. As Augustine said, without God, we cannot. And without us, he will not. I know I'm laboring this a little bit, but you see, prayer is different. With intercessory prayer, we are asking God to do something about a problem, an issue, or a situation. We're asking him to intervene and do something. But when we, when we bless, we are speaking for God on his behalf. It's quite different. So that when, we, when we are intercessory prayer, we're, we're asking God. And now we're speaking on his behalf in the name of Jesus. And I am... Absolutely persuaded now that God desires to bless us, but even more, He desires for us to bless for for us to bless men. Like God desires to bless mankind, but even more so, He desires for His people to bless mankind. Now, in fact, I believe that prayer and blessing are often best together, complementing each other. But let's just take an example, like peace, for example. I could, I could pray an intercessory prayer, something like this. I could say, dear God, Jean is in turmoil. She's frustrated, Lord. Lord, remove all of her anxiety and grant her the peace of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? It's a good prayer. 
But it may be better to say, Dear Jean, I bless you with overflowing peace, the peace of Christ. I break all anxiety off you. See, that's authority. I break all anxiety off you in the name of Jesus. And I release, that's authority, and I release this perfect peace. Receive it now. So prayers can become begging sessions and not prayers of authority that God has designed for us. You know, I, I read something the other day, and I can't remember who, who said it, but it went something like this. This is not a perfect quote, but it meant something like this. For every example that you show in the Bible of, of where prayer changes something, I'll show you 10 times more examples where saying has changed something. Okay. I've labored that enough, but I just wanted to say that. And the, and the next thing that I also wanted, I wanted to say is that we have to be very careful that we don't curse. And, um, you know, when Isaiah came into the presence of God, for example, he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. So God wanted to use Isaiah to speak on his behalf, to the people of Israel, but he wouldn't do it until he cleaned his mouth. Same thing with Jeremiah. He said to Jeremiah, if you will utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. In other words, you will speak on my behalf. And James says, don't let blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. And Jesus said, you will be accountable for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. And like I, like I said, I, I read stuff on Facebook and I hear Christians talk and, 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 and there's all this cursing that, that comes out about our government, about our prime minister, and I don't know how many other things. It's almost like there's a um, some sort of funny game that people play. I don't know what it is. But anyway, but let me just tell you one story. And this is not my story. I read this, but I thought this is so typical. A pastor was passing by a nightclub. And in this nightclub, there were all sorts of bad things happening, you can imagine. And so the pastor cursed the nightclub. On the face of it, that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do, doesn't it? He cursed the nightclub. He commanded it to shut down in the name of Jesus. And he said, well, God spoke to him. He said, why are you cursing my people? I love these people. Why are you cursing them? So the pastor changed tack and he blessed the people. I don't know exactly what he said now, but he, I know that he blessed instead of cursing. And within two weeks, the nightclub shut down all by itself. I mean, amazing things happen when you bless. And I think sometimes we are very, care very careless about the way that we speak even about our health. You know, many times when we speak about our sicknesses and things like that, we're actually making a landing strip for, for sickness to get to land. Anyway, I won't say any more about that, but you get the idea. So finally, I'll just, uh, just say a few quick things um, because there are all kinds of different, different situations and usually I don't have time to talk about these. But... I've just found that there is still so much unforgiveness around. But even apart from that, Jesus said we are to bless those who curse us, who hurt us, who wrong us, and not merely forgive them, but to bless them. But forgiveness itself is just so important. I'm sure you've heard this quote, but I'll just say it again. Someone once said that anger is a poison more hurtful to the cup that carried it than to the object on which it is poured. Well, I would say that it is also true that blessing sweetens the cup out of, what, out of which it is poured, at, as much, at least as much as the objects upon which it is poured. See, so many people have, have written to me and said, when I bless somebody, I get blessed. And it's, all, it's almost a joy to bless. They're almost feeling guilty that they're getting blessed more than the person that they're blessing. So blessing changes, it changes you. 
you know, just the other night I was, someone came up for prayer and she, she was a lovely woman. In fact, I know she goes to Faith Point. She's in one of the Faith Point groups, she told me. And, um, and she said to me, and she, she was full of the Lord, you know, she was a lovely lady. But she said to me, I'm stuck. I feel stuck. And I said, is there anyone you need to forgive? And she said, well, yes, there is. There's about 20-something people I need to forgive. She actually said that. And um, and one of those people turned out to be her mother, you see. See, I've, I've, I'm finding this as well, you know. It's not just the dads. It's, it can be the mums too. And in this particular case, mum would say to her, if it wasn't for you kids, I could be. I would have. I could have gone out having a good time. And uh, that's the second time, or well, third time, I've heard that from from a lady. So anyway, anyway I got to bless her mother. I'm just saying, forgiveness, going beyond forgiveness to blessing. She was able to bless her mother, and it was beautiful. Blessing ourselves. I've talked about it. I don't need to say any more about that. But I will say. Um, you know how the other day, as Phil said, I talked about our photo being on God's mantelpiece. And I talked about how God sees us as being locked in the marble, like David, like Michelangelo Angelo and the David, and he's chipping away all the things that are not David, and he's chipping away all the things that are not are not God's design for each of us. That God is is most focused on who we are becoming rather than all the dirty bits he has to chip off. Whereas sometimes we can focus on the dirty bits and, feel, and get condemned and all that. And um, But one of the things was when you put your wife up there, for example, your spouse or um, even other Christians that you don't like, just remember that God looks at them the same way as he looks at you. And, um, and so a lot of critical talk can stop. And so on and so on. I think that's enough for today. Um, although I might just mention again our community, our city and our nation. You know how I've talked about prayer and blessing? And we know that uh, God said that uh, if my people who would humble themselves and pray, etc., etc. I think... And this, with under the new covenant, we should not only pray, but it should be a case of if my people who would humble themselves and bless the nation. I tell you what, if you start blessing New Zealand, it feels very, very different from when you from when you pray for New Zealand. Although, in fact, we need to do both, of course. So often it's there.